Some heroes are born, some find themselves embroiled in divine prophecy. Others emerge from the unlikeliest of circumstances, like the depths of a dank dungeon, or knelt over a chopping block, staring up at the hooded executioner. Tamriel has no shortage of existential threats, and thankfully there is always a hero ready to rise in response and save the world. These fearless mortals slay dragons, thwart Daedric princes, and even kill living gods. But who was Tamriel's greatest hero? Who faced the toughest odds? Who overcame the most evil? And who will be remembered by the people of Tamriel for the rest of time? Well, ladies and gents, we're going to answer these questions today. We've taken the three mightiest champions from across the continent, and we're going to compare their stories, their accomplishments, and their powers. And we will determine Tamriel's greatest hero. So let's get started. If there's one thing I know about legendary heroes, it's that they don't just pop up to rescue cats from trees and apprehend the village's peeping Tom. No, real heroes appear when real danger is afoot, when some dastardly bastard threatens to take over the world, or a god decides he's bored and wants to burn civilizations, like anthills under his enormous magnifying glass. And in typical fantastical fashion, Tamriel's heroes are the subjects of prophecy. They're rather predictable in this sense, but you can't blame them. It'd be like being the world's best wrestler, but you have to climb into the ring without any introduction. Where's the drama in that? A good prophecy is the Elder Scrolls equivalent to John Cena's You Can't See Me. Our first hero came in response to a great betrayal, when the tribunal of demigods Vivek, Almalexia, and Sofa Sil defied the will of Azura. Her wrath spread over Morrowind like an ash storm. She cursed the gold-skinned Kaima and transformed them into the grey-skinned, red-eyed Dunma. For their blasphemy, they were cursed. And with the curse came a promise. The Chosen One would return to cast down the false gods. After the death of Indaril Nerevar, the Tribunal had assured Azura that they would not meddle with Kagranak's tools or the heart of Lorcan. This sacred oath was swiftly broken, and the three mortals became gods. Azura told them that she would use her powers over dusk and dawn to make sure Nerevar would come back and make things right again. But the Tribunal laughed at her and said that soon they would be gods themselves and that the Kaima people would forget their old ways of worship. Thousands of years after their apotheosis, the Tribunal were still the gods of Morrowind, and the old ways of worship were remembered only by a few. And the murder of Nerevar was known to fewer still. But his queen and generals still feared his return, for the words of Azura lingered long and they saw the mark of her curse on their people every day. Hero number two likely thought he or she was going to die in a slump on the frigid cobbled floor of an imperial prison cell, listening to the obnoxious taunts of Valen Dreff. That was until Destiny came walking down the steps of the prison in a white fur mantle, claiming to have seen the prisoner in their dreams. The Emperor would be assassinated momentarily, the Septim dynasty seemingly at an end, the barrier between the mortal realm and oblivion was weakened, and Mehrun's Dagon was waiting in the Deadlands with his legions of Daedra. The only hope for all of Tamriel lay in the hands of this humble prisoner, who was tasked with recovering the Amulet of Kings, and finding the secret heir to the Imperial Throne. This unwashed prisoner would traverse the feculent sewers before emerging on the shores of Lake Remare. Had the hero not submerged themselves beneath the water, they probably could have defeated Dagon with their stench alone. Nevertheless, the whole of Tamriel was on the verge of total destruction, and the whole continent was united in prayer. O oh, divines, please deliver us our saviour. The final hero might just have been the unlikeliest of the bunch. The people of Skyrim were completely unaware of just how close to doom they really were. And where was our hero? Well, they were tied up in the back of a horse-drawn cart, caught in the midst of a civil war, which was entirely trivial when compared to the real draconic danger looming over the realm. This hero stepped off the cart in Helgen, transformed their gender, race, and appearance in front of some astonished onlookers, and was quickly ushered over to the blood-stained chopping block. Had the hero knelt over just a tiny bit faster, or had the executioner not stalled a moment to scratch his balls before swinging the axe? Well, the whole world would have been eaten. Alduin, the World Eater, had returned, and this meant only one thing to the Nords, the end of time. He had been banished thousands of years prior, sent forward in time by an Elder Scroll, but now they had caught up with the future, and Alduin was ready to complete his task. And to aid him, he resurrected the many dragons buried across the province. 
These dragons could be killed, but few warriors had the skill and courage required to slay one. As for Alduin, well, the first time it took three legendary heroes wielding the power of the Fum and an Elder Scroll to defeat him. And even then it was only temporary. Tamriel needed a hero. On a certain day to uncertain parents, incarnate Moon and Star reborn. Azura's prophecy began vague. Indoril Nerevar reborn would not be so easy to pick out of a lineup. He could be of any race, he could even be a she. No wonder the tribunal were paranoid. They were demigods, so they rarely felt fear. But to ignore the gravity of Azura's vows would be folly even for them. Neither blight nor age can harm him. So when Azura's Chosen arrived in Vardenfell, he would be immune to the negative symptoms of Corpus, the deadly skin blight spewing from Red Mountain and plaguing the region. But he would keep the positive symptoms, disease immunity and agelessness. The prophecy also dictates that Nerevar Reborn, or the Nerevarine as this hero became known, would harness the charm, strength and leadership skills needed to unite the Great Houses and the Velofi tribes. Cyrodiil's great hero could not rely on the assurances of higher power Whatever fate chose him or her did not offer any glorious rewards like immortality or disease immunity. They would take the backseat to Martin Septim, whose blood was needed to stop the Oblivion Crisis. But that does not mean they would be forgotten or remain nameless. Quite the contrary, this hero would go by many names, such as the Champion of Cyrodiil, the Hero of Kvatch, and the Saviour of Bruma. They would even be immortalized by a statue in Bruma. The Doverkin, our third hero, did not acquire his power, but was born with it. In the language of dragons, Doverkin literally translates to dragon kin, dragon child or dragon born. However, it has also been interpreted differently, as Dove means dragon, and Ar means hunter. So it could also translate to born hunter of dragons. This distinction between syllables is key to Alduin and his draconic allies, especially once they hear the dragon Dragonborn prophecy. Centuries ago, the Akaviri Dragon Guard carved their crowning Masonic glory, Alduin's Wall. This elaborate edifice foreshadowed Alduin's return and his consumption of the world. Knowing of the destruction to come, the Greybeards called out to this rumored hero and tested him. The hero passed. Like a legendary Dragonborns of the past, he was born with the body of a mortal, but the soul of a dragon. While most wielders of the Fum, like Jurgen Windcaller and Ulfric Stormcloak, spent decades mastering the voice, the Dragonborn could absorb the souls of dead dragons, learning words of power instantaneously. But with great power comes great responsibility. And what did our heroes accomplish with their divine gifts? The Nerevarine arrived at the port of Sedanin, and with this, Azura's first trial was complete. Dagoth Garrus cursed the Nerevarine with Corpus, and Dive Fear removed the negative symptoms, granting him immunity to aging as mentioned in the second trial. He united the Great Houses as well as the Ashlander tribes, and then Nerevar Moon and Star Reborn climbed Red Mountain, braving ash storms and hordes of putrid blight beasts. But these were minor obstacles when compared to the dreaded cliff races. It would be a different folk hero who managed to slay all the cliff races in Morrowind. The Nerevarine's deeds had a much more significant consequence. In the pinnacle of the Dwemer ruin at Red Mountain, Nerevar confronted his old companion, Vorin Dagoth, and they dueled to the beat of the Doom Drum, exchanging blows on the rickety bridge above the undulating lava flows of the volcano. Dagoth Ur offered the Nerevarine the power of a Kulakan, but he could do nothing to prevent Azura's prophecy from coming true. He ate the sin of the sixth house. He severed Ur's connection to the heart of Lorcan, destroyed the second Numidium, and killed the now mortal Dagoth Ur. The heart subsequently disappeared from the mortal realm, and the tribunal of demigods were returned to mortal form. Almalexia, driven to madness, killed Sofa Sil. The Nerevarine killed Almalexia, and the fate of Vivek remains a mystery. The champion of Cyrodiil evaded the Mythic Dawn assassins, keeping the Amulet of Kings out of their midst. He then located the secret Septimera and aided the Imperials in their attempts to defend Kvatch from the invading Daedra hordes. He entered the Oblivion Gate, scouring the Deadlands in search of the Sigil Stone. Closing an Oblivion Gate is no easy feat, but that was only the beginning. The hero of Kvatch infiltrated the Mythic Dawn, stole the Mysterium Xarxes, defeated Dagon's forces at Bruma, and entered Gaia Alata, killing Mankar Cameron and destroying the realm. 
With the hero's aid, Martin Septim was able to don the Amulet of Kings, relight the dragon fires, and transform into an avatar of Akatosh, sending Mehrunes Dagon back to the Deadlands. With the crisis averted, the champion of Cyrodiil turned his attention to the returning Aelid Sorcerer King, Umaril the Unfeathered. He reclaimed the lost relics of the Divine Crusader, and completed what Pelennor Whitestrake had started. He then travelled to the realm of Sheagorath, the Shivering Isles. He bested the Prince of Order, Jigalag, in single combat, and mantled the Mad God, becoming Sheagorath. By the time he ruled the Asylums, the Champion of Cyrodiil had more titles than Daenerys Targaryen. Hero of Gavach, Saviour of Bruma, Champion of Cyrodiil, the Divine Crusader, Lord Sheagorath, Mad God of the Shivering Isles. And if you want to include the faction endings in his achievements, you can add Guildmaster of the Fighters Guild, Archmage of the Mages Guild, Grey Fox of the Thieves Guild, Listener of the Dark Brotherhood, Grand Champion of the Arena, and Lord of Battlehorn Castle. Apparently he was such a celebrity in the Heartland that he got himself an adoring fan. But even if we only acknowledge the main story and DLC endings, the Champion of Cyrodiil achieved a great deal, especially considering his humble origins. After proving himself to be the dragon born before the Greybeards, the Dovahkin reformed the Blades, restoring traditions wiped out by the Falmor some decades prior. He learned the shouts needed to rend Alduin from the skies, captured and rode a dragon, and journeyed to Sovngarde to defeat the Eater of Worlds. And most impressive of all, he walked the streets of Whiterun countless times without succumbing to the urge to Fusrodar Nazim off the throat of the world. I wish I could say I too took the high road, but that would be a lie. Stew that I want to try out. Do you get to the Cloud District very often? Oh, what am I saying? Sure. Of course you don't. Come on over here! Come on over here! No, you flip me off! Come on, Dower! No, no, no! Come on! You're not an intellectual! You're a fake and a fraud! With the world saved from the Devourer, the last Dragonborn turned his attention to the vampire threat looming in the Sea of Ghosts. By killing Lord Harkon of the ancient Volkahar clan, the Dovahkin successfully foiled his second apocalyptic event. Harkon had hoped to use Auriel's bow to blot out the sun, creating a world ruled by vampires. He then travelled to Hermaeus Mora's realm of oblivion Apocrypha to kill Marak, the first ever dragonborn. Each hero was essential in their time, but who was the greatest? Nerevar Moon and Star reborn to save Morrowin from corruption and disease, the champion of Cyrodiil, who crawled from the Imperial sewers and saved Tamriel from total destructive revolution, and the last dragonborn, the mortal born with dragon's blood, destined to defeat the draconic harbinger of the apocalypse, Alduin. Well, I hate to say it, but the answer is really straightforward, and there's no competition. The champion of Cyrodiil outmatched the Prince of Determinism and literally became a god. How can you compete with that? He may be batshit crazy now, but can our other heroes stand up against a Daedric Prince? If we compare them to the champion of Cyrodiil prior to him entering the Shivering Isles, we have a much closer competition. The Nerevarine killed the demigod Almalexia, as well as the immortal guardian of the heart, Dagoth Ur. The latter of these beings his crowning achievement. Dagoth Ur was being empowered by the heart of Lorcan, while the tribunal were growing weaker without it and feared to challenge Ur. Overturning the tribunal who had ruled Morrowind for centuries was no easy feat, but Vivek had stood alone in maintaining the ghost fence, and much of his divine energy was tied up in this. With Dagoth Ur defeated and the heart gone, the tribunal lost their godhood. Vivek's fate is unknown, and we know Almalexia in a bout of madness murdered Sophacil, so the Nerevarine can only take credit for slaying Almalexia. She was a mighty warrior, but without the power of Lorcan's heart, she was a shadow of her former self. So, the Nerevarine ended the tribunal, became ageless, and killed two gods who weren't quite gods. The last dragonborn killed a vampire lord, a dragonborn, and most significantly, the firstborn of Akatosh, Alduin, who was destined to eat the world. The last dragonborn certainly had the most superior powers of the three heroes. The Nerevarine without Azura's protection, and the champion of Cyrodiil before reaching godhood, would likely have been obliterated by the sheer might of the Fum. However, I would argue that the Nerevarine's deeds were more impressive. Yes, the last dragonborn killed Alduin, but not without the help of three more legendary warriors, Gormleif Goldenhilt, Hakon One-Eye, and Feldir the Old. As for the champion of Cyrodiil, Umril the Unfeathered and Mankar Cameron were formidable foes, but it was Martin Septim who became an avatar of Akatosh, ending the Oblivion Crisis. 
As of the present day, all three of our heroes are likely alive. The last Dragonborn's fate after returning from Sovngarde has yet to be revealed. The Champion of Cyrodiil is busy governing the Shivering Isles, and the Nerevarine is somewhere in Akavir, so their stories aren't necessarily over. But with everything taken into consideration, Tamriel's greatest hero is the Champion of Cyrodiil. This hero was not only instrumental in preventing Tamriel from being annihilated by Dagon and his Daedra Hordes, but he mantled Shia Gorath, becoming a god. What do you think? Who is your favourite hero in Tamriel? And who do you think was the greatest? I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching. My name's Drew, and I'll see you in the next one.